here is a briefing on the basic design element of line. There are more elements when you consider designs in 3D, but these are the four foundations for all visual communications. And since we're designing in 2D, we're gonna focus on these four this semester. Um, the four elements are line, shape, or form, which I will probably use interchangeably, color, and texture. And they can all operate on their own successfully, but they create a really powerful image when they're used together. So this presentation will be about line specifically. Our first love in design and art is the element of line. This is the most simple yet quite versatile tool that we can use. It bridges objects and composition, it defines forms, and it activates 2D space. In the graphic on the slide, you can see that line has um, some defining characteristics and connective characteristics. And we can define line the same way that math does. It's a point in motion. It is a type of vector, if you will, that has direction and sometimes changes magnitude. So let's look at some examples of line quality. The element of line can actually be kind of an abstract concept concept to grasp. Um, even though we use lines to draw shapes and forms, they don't always exist in 3D. Uh, for example, we don't walk around with outlines around our bodies like cartoon characters, and if we did, we'd look like the chick on the left. Kind of crazy. <laughs> I mean, our eyes perceive edges of forms as lines, um, but since it's so complicated, artists really have to be well-versed in the use of line and how they can give the viewer an understanding of space. And so there are four types of line quality that we'll talk about. And the first one is orientation or the position of lines in a composition. Here are some examples. Um, horizontal lines imply stability. And so like when you look at an, uh, a landscape drawn, you can tell that the horizontal line is the ground, it grounds you, it implies stability. Uh, diagonal lines and curving lines imply motion and movement, as you can see in this image. And vertical lines, or lines that go straight up and down, imply the potential for change. And they kind of um, act in our minds as like a stack of blocks or something, and so they have a very strong potential to topple over or fall over. They just appear uh, more unstable than the other types of lines. Quality number two is direction, which refers to the implied movement that lines can offer. And now I know you're thinking like direction and orientation, aren't those kind of the same thing? Well, in this case, they're a little bit different. They're related, but they're different. Orientation is the way that lines are laid out. Direction is the movement that's implied. So whether they're coming forward or backwards, as opposed to laying flat or standing up. I hope that makes sense. And so in this example that you see on the slide, the thick lines, or the thicker parts of the lines, I guess, appear closer to your eye, and the thin lines appear farther away. So when a single line has different weights or thicknesses, our brains perceive a type of implied movement forward and backward. So drawings of hair are really great, hair and fur are really great examples of directions. Uh, achieved through the use of line. Quality number three is continuity or linear flow. This also aids in our understanding of direction. So again, we're related, but we're not the same thing as direction and we're not the same thing as orientation. So here, the continuous line on the top tends to generate a stronger sense of direction or directions in this case, than the broken lines on the bottom. You can see that it's more cohesive on the top. Quality number four relies on medium, and when artists and designers use the word medium or media, you really have to pay attention to your context clues, because media here is the plural of medium, and what we mean is the materials used. Media does not refer to, sometimes, does not refer to social media or the media as in capital M, the news, or something. Um, here, it refers to materials used. So uh, I'll talk about it in more in a second. But the media 
used to create lines can directly impact the effects of the character of the images that they create. So for example, the image on the right um, was made using charcoal. It's like a, a type of black chalky substance. Uh, since charcoal, which is literally burned wood, um, since it's so soft and crumbly like chalk, artists can generate multiple line effects, the, the pressure changes that you can use with charcoal. And so the medium used here is charcoal. You got it? Okay. The drawing on the left, uh, drawings like these are more precise. These were probably done with um, a fine marker or a pen. And as you can see, the lines here are very different because the medium implies a type of crisp of line and it just offers high information content. The, the lines are more crisp. They're not as jagged and fuzzy as the charcoal. And now that you're confused, <laughs> let's take it further and question why lines can be so important. This will involve a little bit of analysis on your part, so continue to consider why these artists said, I'm going to draw it like this. So always have that question in your mind. When you look at a work of art and you're, of course, evaluating it, always consider what the artist chose to do, the artist's intention that will help you. So let's look at the intention of these two different artists. Um, these drawings that you see here are of hands, obviously, and they were uh, done by different artists. Each one of them provides a clear image of multiple hands and uh, positions, and they both use contour lines or actual lines. So that's a that's another vocabulary word, actual lines, lines that define something very clearly. <laughs> uh, this will be in contrast to implied lines, which we'll talk about next. Okay, back to it. Um, Dickinson, Eleanor Dickinson's drawings are careful and they are precise. They really define the anatomy of the hands. So lines here are used in actuality to define the form and the shape and the spatial qualities that hands can possess. Um, Rico Lebrun's drawings, though, I mean, they define the anatomy of the hands. You can tell that those are hands and you can tell where the knuckles are and everything. Uh, they also used contour lines, but in these drawings, we see a greater sense of the hands' movement through his gestural handling of the medium. And on the slide, you can see the definition for gesture drawing. If that confused you, I'm sorry. A gesture drawing is a method of quick and loose handling of media. So the artist uh, drew the hands more quickly with less precision, and um, it's, it's just a type of gesture, quick, expressive gesture, very sketchy. Okay, and the opposite of actual line is called implied line. Implied lines is exactly what it says. They just suggest, they imply connections. Um, these types of lines are and forms are useful and they're actually fun because they actively engage the viewer. The viewer, we, you, everybody, um, everyone who has sight naturally seeks visual unity. And if you're given enough clues, you will subconsciously fill in the blanks to connect visual parts of an object. And that also gives you a sense of closure. That's why, I mean, you guys have seen those things on the internet that are like um, letter scrambles or word scrambles where the first and last letter of each word is in its place, but the middle letters are all scattered and you can still get a gist of what the word is. You can still read the sentence fairly quickly. That's called closure. Um, we also encounter this type of subconscious handling of visuals with the AT&T logo. The top logo you can see is an older version, um, but you can detect that there's no outline of a circle. You look around that entire thing and there's no complete continuous outline of a circle. The lines within the circle, though, are so close together that they provide us plenty of information to understand that this is a circle and that there's a highlight on the top left. But the new logo is even more sophisticated. You can notice um, the implied line informs us of both that circular shape, but also a volume. It looks like a sphere. It looks more like a sphere than the top logo. And so to go back to the types of line we talked about, the orientation 
of these lines is curved. You can see that they're curvy lines, and that implies dynamic and form defining. The direction of these lines is also clear. Um, look on the right side of the logo. The lines get really thick, and then they get really thin. They, cut, they like end in a point, and that, of course, implies an edge. It gives us the illusion of roundness. And also the continuity of the lines continue around the logo. They, they're, they're not broken up. Each, I mean, each line is separate, but the lines themselves are not broken up, so it gives us another sense of roundness. And all of these things working together allow us to see the spherical quality of the newer AT&T logo. Isn't that cool? I think that's fun. Here is another method. Um, this method is pretty exclusive to the arts. Um, graphic designers sometimes utilize these this method of networking but, or networks, but um, not as often as artists do, especially in their everyday sketchbooks. Uh, this is called a linear network. Um, linear networks are uh, lines that artists use to create a range of values or darks and lights. Michelangelo used methods like hatching, cross-hatching, and cross-contour lawn drawings to sketch this particular subject, and we're going to go over each one of those. Hatching, pay attention to these guys, hatching is a network of parallel lines. You can see um, hatching used on the back of the head and the neck of this subject, and of course in the background just to the left of his nose. Notice how the closer the lines are together, the darker the value appears to your eye. Cross hatching takes it a step further um, and it, it utilizes a layering of hatching. So um, let me see, look in the middle of the satyr's cheek. You can see like a web, like a grid of perpendicular hatched lines and these um, the crossing of these lines help to define a flatness so this is like a plane he's michelangelo's defining a plane on the face and the last one is cross contour these are the curvy versions of cross hatching so um in the drawing it's best seen on the back of the satyr's head um, the really dark sections of the cheeks um, the folds or the foldy areas of his nose and like his temple and eyebrow area. You can see examples of cross contours. This is just like hat, uh, cross hatching, it's just with curvy lines. And what this does is give the viewer a really, really powerful illusion of three dimensionality. You can really detect the um, light and shadow falling on the subject's face, and we get a sense of roundness and sharpness. And finally, this brings us to your first sketchbook assignment of the class. So it's your turn. Um, what I want you to do is open to a new page in your sketchbook. So this should not be drawn on the same page that you just took notes in. Make sure you take notes, guys. They don't have to be beautiful or super thorough, but uh, you are going to turn in some notes at the end of the semester with your sketchbook portfolio. So. Go back and make sure you got some notes on the line lecture you just listened to. And on a new page in your sketchbook, I want you to draw five separate scale bars, just like the ones that you see on the slide. And they can be blank because you're going to fill them in with lines, but make sure that they take up over 75% of the page. I don't want little baby scale bars, please. And go ahead and separate those scales into five equal sections. You can do six equal sections because that's what's pictured. Just It's up to you. Five different empty scale bars divided into five or six equal sections. And so in the first section, you're going to utilize hatching. And in the second bar, you're going to utilize cross hatching or cross contour. And your goal, like this image, is to make one end of your scale bar the lightest and the opposite end of that scale bar the darkest. And everything in between should be uh, a nice gradient of shades from light to dark or from dark to light. Whichever direction you decide to go is fine. And after you've done the hatching and the cross-hatching scale bars, 
you can fill the other, other three scales with lines of your choice. Feel free to look at examples online. Um, people get creative. There is one student who did a scale bar of hair texture. It sounds, it sounds weird, but it was gorgeous. Um, you can use squiggly lines, bubbles, stippling, which is just dots. Uh, but make sure that you do not blend your media together. And so to prevent that, you're only going to use one drawing utensil. It can be a pencil or a pen or a marker. Just make sure that it's only one color. Just use one color, please, for this entire page. Don't blend your stuff, please. Just use lines. Your scales, remember, should be drawn large. The entire group of your five scales should take up most of your sketchbook page. 75% or larger on the page. And, I mean, you, you can do this assignment more than once. Uh, you can continue with more than five scale bars if you want to. Just keep in mind that you're going to photograph all of these assignments and turn them in at the end of the semester. So make them nice and neat and beautiful. Make yourself proud. If you have any questions about this sketchbook assignment, feel free to email me or um, ask your classmates on the forum in D2L. Always be prepared to attach a picture, like a progress picture, if you need to. That'll just help us all um, get a sense of where your progress is and how to help you. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you're not too confused about line and the different types and the different uses. But if you are, feel free to reach out. We got you. We want you to succeed. And I hope you have fun with this. Be on the lookout for the next set of element lectures on D2L.